a new super Earth in the habitable zone. Did Jupiter save the early Earth? Astronomers see 3 I Atlas as it passes behind the Sun. The X 59 quiet supersonic plane gets tested. And in Space Bites Plus, do re entering satellites put the wrong kinds of metal in the atmosphere? All this and more in this week's Space Bites. The hunt is on for an Earth sized world orbiting around a Sun like star in the habitable zone. Now, we have plenty of examples of other kinds of planets that are interesting. We don't have that exact perfect Earth 2.0 yet, but the search continues. We see a lot of Earth sized worlds orbiting around red dwarf stars, though, in the habitable zone. And now astronomers have found a super Earth orbiting in the habitable zone. It's not the first and it won't be the last. But what makes this really exciting is that it's only 18 light years away from us. It's designated GJ 251 C. And the C means that it's actually the second planet that's been found in this system. And the planet was discovered using the radial velocity method. Astronomers went through 20 years of radial velocity data on this star GJ 251. And they had evidence that there was a planet orbiting very close to this red dwarf star. And then with more and more data, they realized that there was a second much larger planet and that this one is in the habitable zone the planet has about four times the mass of the Earth, and it's almost certainly rocky. So it's bigger, heavier, but still in the habitable zone. And so it can have liquid water on its surface and it orbits its star every 54 days. I know this is not the dream, a super earth, not quite habitable for maybe people like us, but there could be life forms on this kind of a world as long as it does have liquid water on its surface. And to find really close exoplanets, this is the dream, because then you don't need as powerful a telescope to be able to resolve the planet from its star. So expect a lot more attention on GJ 251C in the future. We've got a story about this from Evan Goff on Universe Today. One of the ongoing mysteries from James Webb are the little red dots. We talk about this every couple of weeks now at this point, and we don't really know what the little red dots are, but they are very dense bright objects seen early on in the universe. And there's sort of two major theories. One is that this is the sort of accretion disk around a growing supermassive black hole that's gathering a lot of material. The other possibility is that it's some kind of very dense galaxy, or maybe the dense core of a galaxy where the stars are incredibly close together. And now astronomers have identified a dwarf galaxy that's in orbit around the Milky Way that has a lot of characteristics of that latter idea, a very dense galaxy. So this dwarf galaxy is called Segway 1, and it's about 75,000 light years away and is one of the dimmest satellite galaxies that has ever been found around the Milky Way. It has about 600,000 times the mass of the sun, but it only has the luminosity of about 300 suns, which means that it has a lot of mass for the amount of light that it's giving off. And so that means it's very dark matter dominated. Or there is an unusually massive black hole at the heart of this galaxy. And what this is causing is a very dense collection of stars surrounding the center of this galaxy it has a very high mass to light ratio and has a lot of the characteristics that are very similar to these little red dots. And it is practically in our galactic neighborhood, just merely 75,000 light years away. We've got a story about that from Evan Goff. We know that Jupiter can absorb a lot of the comets and asteroids that make their way into the solar system. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, Jupiter is our protector. But Jupiter is also responsible for pushing a lot of the asteroids out of the asteroid belt and onto orbits that bring it very close to Earth. You can blame all of the near Earth objects on Jupiter. So it's more like a frenemy. Sometimes it protects us, sometimes it's harming us. But it might have saved the Earth in the early solar system. As astronomers have gathered a lot of evidence of exoplanets out there in the universe, one very common feature is that you have exoplanets that orbit very close to their stars. We know of hot Jupiters and other even terrestrial planets have been found with very close orbits around their star. And it appears what happens is that as the planets are forming, and you've got a lot of material in the protoplanetary disk. And as the planet is scooping up material, 
it will spiral towards the star, kind of like a vacuum cleaner that's going around the star, gathering more material and getting a bit of an orbital kick towards the star. But in the solar system, the three planets in the habitable zone, you know, Venus, Earth and Mars, they're actually bunched up fairly closely from about 0.7 astronomical units away from the sun for Venus to about 1.5 AU for Mars with Earth in the middle. And we don't have these planets spiraling in towards the star. And so simulations have shown that when Jupiter formed, it caused ripples through the solar system. And those ripples caused material to bunch up into very discrete areas, kind of like, like rings in a record. Uh, ask your grandpa what that is. And so that caused material to bunch up and form into a planet without the planets then migrating further inward. And now astronomers have found meteorites that match up with these simulations that they see different ages of meteorites that show the early history of the solar system. We've got a story about that from Matt Williams. Well, Comet 3i Atlas has finally reached its perihelion. This is the closest point to the sun on October 29th at around 1147 Universal Time, 3i Atlas came within 1.36 astronomical units from the sun. And something that I've been saying for a while is that now it has gone behind the sun and we are no longer able to view it from our telescopes and we have to wait until it comes out the other side for the telescopes to be able to continue their observations. But that's not exactly true. There are a bunch of telescopes that are continuously observing the sun, and they've actually been able to continue to track the movements of 3i Atlas, even though it is really close to the sun from our perspective. So I've got a couple of pictures that I want to show you. The first one comes from a NOAA weather satellite, and it has an instrument that is tracking the sun and it has a coronagraph that blocks the light from the sun. And it's able to see the movement of 3i Atlas above the sun. And then NASA's punch mission is also watching the sun and is able to block the light from the sun and is able to show 3i Atlas in a region around the sun. And both of these spacecraft are calculating that it's about 11th magnitude. And it hasn't done anything funny, it hasn't slowed down, hasn't stopped, hasn't changed direction. It's continuing exactly on its trajectory. But we're still a few weeks away from it being far enough away from the sun that regular telescopes can be able to resolve it. So wait for that and we should get a lot more really cool pictures of it once it's come out the other side of the sun. And of course, it continues on, it's gonna make its closest approach in in mid-December towards the Earth, but still pretty far away. But if you've got a small telescope, when it does return to the night sky, you will probably be able to resolve it at about 11th magnitude. And I'll try to use that guy, which we'll talk about at the end of the show, to do that as well. We've got great coverage of the perihelion of 3i Atlas from David Dickinson on Universe Today. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best space news story of the week. And the winner last week was that two missions are going to come very close to the tail of Comet 3i Atlas. So thank you everybody who voted last week. Of course, by the time you're watching this video, we will put the new vote into the post tab here on our channel. So if you wanna see this vote every week, subscribe to our channel, click on the notifications bell, go into the post section and vote on a bunch of past polls, and then that will train the algorithm to show you more of these votes in the future. NASA and Lockheed Martin are testing a new experimental aircraft, the X-59. That's what the X is for. And you know, there's a lot of amazing aircraft that have been tested in the past, and this continues this tradition. The X-59 though, is about seeing whether you can make an airplane go supersonic and yet be quiet. Normally when an airplane goes supersonic, it can create these sonic booms that are very loud. This was one of the concerns with the Concorde. It would fly faster than the speed of sound. You could fly between say London and New York very quickly, but it made a racket when it was passing over cities and towns. And so NASA and Lockheed Martin are trying to come up with a shape on the front of this jet that will reduce the amount of the sonic booms. Maybe they can get to the point where these things can fly overhead and not be much louder than just a regular jet aircraft. And so the X-59 has been in development for seven years. It's about 30 meters long. It's about nine meters wide. And it theoretically will be able to fly it up to Mach 1.4, which is the point where it definitely should be generating sonic booms. Now in this test flight, they stayed well below the speed of sound, just making sure that that it can 
do plain things. But eventually, they're going to continue to ramp up the tests and we'll find out whether or not they can make a relatively quiet plane fly faster than the speed of sound. We've got great coverage on this from Alan Boyle. In 1572, a new star appeared in the sky, and this was observed by the famous astronomer Tycho Brahe, and it's received the nickname Tycho's Supernova. And it's one of the last supernova that have been seen in the Milky Way. So he was really lucky. But new evidence shows that it's not just a plain old supernova. It appears that it's a type 1a supernova where a white dwarf star explodes. And to make things even more complicated, it looks like it exploded inside a planetary nebula. Now, a planetary nebula is caused by a white dwarf. So when you have a star like our sun reaches the end of its life, and then it will blow it up into a red giant, it'll puff off its outer layers, and then the core that remains, that is the white dwarf. But it's believed that with the Tycho supernova, it was actually a binary system. And so you had two stars orbiting around each other, one reached the end of its life, puffed out the outer layers, and then both stars were now going through the outer envelope of this dying star. And that's where you got the planetary nebula. And then the other star died and fed material to the white dwarf that was already there. It gathered up enough material, reached this critical limit, and it exploded as a supernova inside this planetary nebula. And then that caused the other star to zip out of the system. And in fact, other type 1 supernova remnants appear to have very similar characteristics. And so what this is saying is that this might be very common, like maybe 80 to 90% of the time when we see a type 1a supernova, it's actually this very specific chain of events where you've got a binary system, one star turns into a white dwarf, then the other star turns into a white dwarf, and then you get the type 1a supernova. We've got a story about this from Mark Thompson. And now it's time for a picture. And speaking of planetary nebulae, this is the planetary nebula NGC 6537, which is also known as the Red Spider Nebula. And this picture was taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. And like, let's just compare a picture of this nebula that was taken by the European Southern Observatory's La Silla Observatory, and then compare it to the James Webb version. And that just shows you how incredibly powerful and sensitive James Webb really is. Like they, they just, they don't even compare. It's incredible. And one of the things that's really interesting about the Red Spider Nebula is that it has this strange, almost like spirograph features where you've got these sort of wisps of material that are being pulled out or like maybe it's like cotton candy. And so astronomers think that there might be a hidden companion, something that hasn't been seen, maybe a black hole, maybe a neutron star or a white dwarf that is pulling material out into strands as it's orbiting around the region where the star died. We've got a story from Mark Thompson. You're watching this episode on YouTube, but the problem with YouTube, of course, is that there's ads ads and more ads. And we try to put the minimum amount of ads in our videos that we can. But of course, YouTube forces us to put ads at the beginning. So we think that it's actually a much better experience to watch our videos over on Patreon. And so over on Patreon, we have a version of this exact same video, but we put one bonus story and it's completely free. You don't have to sign up or pay or anything. You could just go watch it. There'll be a link in the show notes. You can go watch that right now. And the bonus story is about how as satellites are reentering the Earth's atmosphere, atmosphere, they're putting a certain kind of metal into the atmosphere that can cause catalytic reactions with other atmospheric molecules. And this could be a problem for our atmosphere in the future if we keep this up. But if you want even more space news, you should definitely come and check out Universe Today. We are covering you know, 30 to 40 space news stories every week. And I gather all of those stories up and I write a comprehensive newsletter that I send out every Friday. Now, I write every single word in it. There's no advertisements in it at all. It's completely free. You don't have to pay anything. You can go to universetoday.com newsletter to sign up. All right, those are all the stories that we had this week. Now, I'm going to talk about this 
telescope here that I just bought. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Barry Lake Griffin, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bielok, Sai Nielsen, Dark Finga, Dave Veriboff, David Gilton, and David Matz, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Switz, Michael Purcell, One Step for Animals.org, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Richard Williams, Son Sargen, Stephen Fowler Munley, Team 49, Telescopes Canada, Vlad Chaplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So I've added a lot of telescopes to the family uh, this year. Of course, there's the Sea Star, which I bought uh, earlier this year. There's the Vespera 2 that the good folks at Veonis sent to me. And then, of course, there's this first starter telescope that I always recommend people purchase and that I didn't have one. And I've always wanted one. And that is a Dobsonian telescope. So I was doing one of my conference calls with one of the patrons, and they were saying that they picked up a telescope on Facebook Marketplace. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm just going to check and see if there's any telescopes on Facebook Marketplace and see what they're going for and see if the quality is any good. And lo and behold, there was a Skywatcher 8-inch Dobsonian telescope on Facebook Marketplace. It had been sitting there for six weeks, and the price was really good, like about a third of what I would pay if I bought it retail from Amazon, including shipping taxes here in Canada. And so I was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to buy one. <laughs> so I reached out to the seller and came by and picked it up and checked out the telescope. Everything looked great. And so I put it in the back of my car and brought it home and have been using it ever since. We haven't had super clear skies, but I was able to look at Andromeda. I was able to see the double cluster in Perseus. Uh, I was able to look at a couple of other objects before the clouds set in. And this is the perfect kind of instrument if you want to be able to look at Saturn, Jupiter, uh, the moon, Mars, and some of the other bright object in the night sky. And it's the perfect companion to then something that is allows you to take pictures like the sea star. And this is going to be great for looking at comet Lemon, and hopefully I can see Comet 3i Atlas with it when it reappears from behind the sun. So this is just a reminder that these telescopes are there. They're available. You can buy them, check Facebook Marketplace, and every now and then you might find the perfect telescope that you can add to your collection. So hopefully, you know, when it's missing, you'll know that, it, that I've been using it recently. All right, we'll see you next week.